Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or wherever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Good morning, College Mennonite Church. Welcome to Advent 2022. You can cheer, it's okay. Today we begin the process of preparing for Christmas. There are a lot of small steps that go into the process of preparing, and that is what Advent is about. Even here at church, you are going to see the process of preparing happening throughout the coming weeks. I mean, we have, we have a tree stand, but we have no tree. There will be also many other opportunities for you to join in the preparing for Christmas in many different activities throughout our church life over the weeks to come. So look in your church emails for announcements about many, many more opportunities to do that in the coming weeks. But right now, I invite you to join me in the call to worship. And the last phrase of this call to worship for Advent, we will say in both English and Spanish. We watch and we wait for you. Leamos y esperamos por ti. Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who sit on the mercy seat between the cherubim. We stand in your presence, seeking your face. Shine forth, O Lord, in the sight of your people, that we may see you clearly. Stir up your strength in us. Come, rescue us. The time is near. We are watching. Restore us again, O God. Cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved, made whole by your gracious love and kindness. We watch and wait for you. Leamos y esperamos por ti. The Butler family will be lighting our first Advent candle today as we all sing together and are accompanied by the chimes. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Verses, voices together, number 210, and we will sing verses 1 and 2 in unison. O come, O come, Emmanuel. I invite you to turn to number 212 in Voices Together. Comfort, comfort, O my people. 
number 212. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. What a beautiful blessing that our God wants to hear from us and to comfort, encourage, and guide us. As we prepare to join in prayer together, just a reminder to see your Sunday morning email for a list of more detailed prayer concerns. Please join with me in prayer. Loving and listening God, we are grateful that you comfort and guide us amid seasonal pressures and anticipations. Your spirit envelops us in a story, a story of the light of the world. Help us to live in the light of your coming and give us a longing for your kingdom Come to the suffering as savior and comforter. We pray for those who are lonely, for those who feel lost. Help us to be bearers of your light in these circumstances. Break in with your love. Break into our lives where we struggle with sickness or distress. Heal, comfort, and set us free to serve you day after day. God, we lift to you Juana Rojas and Gabby Lozano as each seeks healing in different ways. We lift to you those dealing with chronic pain, those who feel especially stressed or grieved during the holiday season and those who have been victims of recent gun violence. Come, Lord Jesus, bring your guidance and encouragement to each one. Come to us as shepherd and guardian of our souls. 
We remember all those whose hearts grieve. We continue to remember Arlene Marks' family as they grieve and prepare for her memorial service this next Saturday. We lift to you Deb and Paul Buller as they grieve the loss of Deb's mother, Joanna. And we continue to remember Gabriella and Rob Brenneman Ochoa and their family as they grieve the loss of Gabby's mother. Come, Lord Jesus, bring your guidance and comfort to each one. Give us a renewed vision of your powerful love as we remember all the faithful departed from our lives, but not from our hearts. Come, Lord Jesus. Come from heaven with power and great glory. Lift us up to meet you that we may live and reign with you in your new creation. Come, Lord Jesus, do not delay. Give new courage to your people. Keep hope, joy, and peace alive in us. By your coming, raise us to share in the joy of your kingdom on earth as is, as is in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray all these things in el nombre de Jesús. Amen. Children and families, you are invited to come forward to the circle and we will sing together number 828 in Voices Together, verses one and two of There's a Wild Hope in the Wind. And keep your books open as we'll sing verse three as the children go back. Do you know what today is? Do you know what today is? Not really. Does anybody know what today is? Sunday. What's the date? What's the date? It's November 27. Already. What have I been doing for the last month, people? That means that there's 25, 26, 26. There's only 28 days until Christmas. Come on, folks. Where's the tree? We only have 28 days until Christmas. I should have started a long time ago. I have so much to do. Oh, we need to decorate. We need to, I need to go shopping. I need to start wrapping gifts. Oh, I kind of forgot that we have Christmas plates and placemats. Oh, we have so much to do. I, I don't know that I'm going to have time this year. Oh, I need to, oh, we got to fill this thing up. 
Alexa, add tiny candies to the shopping list. Good. Oh, I hope our lights work. What is the chance that our lights work? Oh, the Christmas letter. Oh, why did I ever decided we needed an album for the Christmas letter? Do you think anyone will notice if I skip 2022 and we just jump from 2021 to 2023? I don't know, there's just, there's not enough time. Ah, we need teacher's gifts. Alexa, add teacher's gifts to the shopping list. Um, we need to hang the stockings. Uh, the kids are gonna wanna make Chex Mix. Alexa, add Chex Mix supplies to the shopping list. I just, there is so much to do for Christmas. And I'm not a dad, so I can't speak for dads. But Christmas is a lot of work for moms. It is a lot of work. And I don't know, guys. I don't know if I can do it this year. We're moving. We just put our house on the market. Like, we're kind of sad about moving, but we're excited about the new house. And uh, it's kind of been a hard fall. We had some really terrible things happen at the school that I work at. My heart feels kind of heavy. I just, I don't know if I can do Christmas. People that we love are fighting terrible diseases. People we care about have mental illness and addiction. I just, I don't know if I can do Christmas this year. I just, I don't know. Sarah, Christmas isn't about all of these things. It's not about the Christmas tree. It's not about the Christmas letter. Does anybody here know what Christmas is about? What is Christmas about? Presents. Well, See? That, that might Alexa, be one of the things. Alexa, add thing. presents to the shopping list. That might be one of the things Sarah's thinking about, but there's something else that Christmas is about, too. What do you think, Seth? Jesus' birth. Jesus' birth. That's what Christmas is about. All of these other things are fun and are nice and help us to get into a good, positive spirit, but what Christmas is really about is Jesus' birth. Hopefully we can remember that. You know, when Jesus was born more than 2,000 years ago, Jesus brought hope, right? And even like the promise of Jesus. Think of all the people in, in the Bible, God's people, who clung to the hope of a savior, the promise of a savior. So the promise of Jesus brought hope, the birth of Jesus brought hope, the life of Jesus gives us hope. As we study the life of Jesus, we see glimpses of God here on earth. And the death and resurrection of Jesus give us hope too, because we know that our God is bigger than even death. So I hope that even if your heart is feeling a little sad, that you remember this Christmas season that Jesus brings us hope, just like Jesus did 2,000 years ago. I'm gonna light our first candle, and this is the hope candle. You'll have candles that you can take home too, and I encourage you when you light that hope candle to say, Jesus brings us hope. I'm hoping we can say that three times together as our prayer, and then I'll say amen. Jesus brings us hope. Jesus brings us hope. Jesus brings us hope. Amen.
Our preacher for today is Talasha Kaim Yoder. Please join me in a prayer of blessing for Talasha and us in this time. God of hope, thank you for the moments of hope and the glimpses that we see of how you want our world to function. Because too often we see too many actions that are not as you want them to be. In this moment and in the days to come, May the words of Talasha's mouth and the meditations of our hearts lead us to hope-filled actions of love for our friend, our neighbor, and our enemies. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our scripture for this first Sunday of Advent comes from Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of the Lord. How many peace initiatives have been started and inspired by that passage? It's a familiar one. That swords into plowshares imagery is powerful. But you know, we just read the pretty part of this passage. If you keep reading, you're going to see that that house of Jacob that was so warmly invited to come and walk in the light is pretty heavily indicted. There are accusations of idolatry, of storing up riches, of what one translation called human haughtiness. Ouch! This passage comes at a moment of history, and that moment of history is a time of warfare and destruction. It's a time when Jerusalem is under siege. Nations were battling to see who was going to be in control, who would be the global superpower of the day. And the poet prophet of Isaiah seems to blame the leaders of Israel for the calamity. They were idolatrous, improper stewards, seeking wealth and power rather than the welfare of the people. Things were bad. Things were really bad in the world behind this text. As I was preparing for today's sermon, I thought, haven't I said this before? And then I realize that there's kind of a refrain that I find myself saying at some point every year during Advent. I say it or I write it. And it goes something like this. The world was a mess. It was a time of polarization, corrupt leaders, nations occupying other nations, the powerful few holding all the wealth. It was a time when people were fleeing their homes and becoming refugees a time of fear and change. And that's the world that a baby savior was born into. Every year, I say it or I write it or both, every year. And every year we hear it and think, oh, that could be our world. Every year it rings and sounds familiar because there's always some kind of mess going on. Just like the people in the seventh century BC and the people in the time of Jesus 
we in 2022 are living in a world that is tempted by idolatry, where we're tempted to trust in nations and, rule, and rulers and systems instead of in God, a time of human haughtiness. We're not alone. We're not the first ones to feel this way. Many have gone before and had the same struggles. Each point in history struggling with these age-old temptations of idolatry and holding on to power in its own unique ways. We live in a perpetual mess, and we are in constant need of restoration. It's true now. It was true when Jesus was born. It was true when the prophet Isaiah was speaking these words. And yet... Aren't you glad there's a yet? (laughs) The poet prophet of Isaiah 2 does not begin with this indictment. The poet prophet of Isaiah does not begin with describing the mess. This poet prophet leads with hope. One scholar that I was looking at called it courage of desperation. I prefer imaginative boldness, maybe audacious hope. This is hope that springs from a source that can only be God. In this world of political corruption, the prophet imagines the world with God's dream made real. Instead of being trained to fight, swords are going to be transformed into plowshares. Soldiers become farmers, feeding the people instead of placing them under siege. You hear that? Instead of creating famine, they will solve famine. Nations don't learn war. Instead, they walk in the light of the Lord together. Instead of seeds of corruption being taught, God's wisdom comes forth. Instead of streaming to the distractions of idolatry, the people stream to the mount of the Lord. And instead of putting their trust in nations and rulers and systems, the people put their trust in God. God's instruction will come forth. God will be the judge. The people are getting reoriented toward God. And what I find fascinating is that it's not apocalyptic. That phrase in the beginning, in the days to come or in future days, that doesn't mean some unrealized future. It just means it's not quite here yet. It's coming. It's a process. We'll get there. It's wildly hopeful boldly imaginative. How do we emulate that hope? Sometimes I think it might mean the kind of big, bold visioning that we did as a church several years ago. But I think more often, more daily, it's less a matter of planning and more a matter of catching the hope in the wind. God, the source of hope, is blowing it around. It's, it's not something that we can fit in a box. It doesn't necessarily fit our notions of what it should look like. Maybe it's not always immediately recognizable, but it's there. And often our job is just to catch on to it and follow it, even if we can't see exactly where it's leading. As I was preparing this sermon, there's a story that kept coming to mind for me. It's one that I learned about on sabbatical. And it has to do with hope in the form of chickens and whistling and bear hugs. My maternal grandparents, Wilbert and Viola Berkey, moved their family of nine to Ibonito, Puerto Rico in 1956. They were going there to serve with the Ulrich Foundation, which is a foundation that many in this church have worked with or known about. 
Grandpa was going to work with the poultry project, so establishing layers and meat birds as one form of sustenance and business in the mountains around Ibonito. He hired a 15-year-old named Godofredo to work for him. Godo, as he was more commonly called. Godo had had to quit school and get a job. And he needed to do that because his dad had left the family to go to Chicago to find work. But somehow there had not been a lot of communication and um, the, the family was not receiving support from Godo's father. So Godo, at the age of 15, went to work for the poultry project. He was a good kid, had a bit of a chip on his shoulder and what we might term as church baggage. My grandpa was someone who wore faith on his sleeve. It, it wasn't that he was constantly cr- trying to convert people, it was just part of his daily language. But he learned really quickly that if he mentioned God, Godo would walk off the job. So grandpa had to learn to not mention anything <laughs> about his faith, anything explicitly about God. I think that if my grandpa had just looked at that and tried to play the situation out fully, it would have felt pretty hopeless. Instead, grandpa caught the hope in the wind and did the next faithful thing. When the family was home in Illinois on furlough, he somehow, we're not sure how, tracked down Godo's father in Chicago and drove there and showed up at his door. He handed Godo's dad a plane ticket, a one-way ticket to Puerto Rico and said, you need to go home to your family. And if you go home to your family, I will give you a job until you can find another one. Godo's father used the ticket. He came back to Ibonito. He worked for my grandpa and then found another job. However, life continued to be hard for Godo. And that is the last my grandpa knew of the story until 1988. In 1988, my Uncle Merv and his family, my mom's older brother, served in Puerto Rico for a year. They were at Batania, a Mennonite school that, again, is near and dear to some in this congregation. Now, Merv had been warned never to open his door late at night, but he's not always a rule follower. And so one night when someone knocked on the door, he just opened it wide up without thinking. A man walked into his house and said, are you Berkey? And Merv said, yes and the man grabbed him in a bear hug. And he said, Berkey saved my life. It was Godo. And when my grandpa came to visit a few months later, he did get to learn the rest of the story from Godo. Godo had had a troubled life. And one night in his adulthood, he was in town, completely drunk. He was estranged from his wife and children. And I think we would describe it as hitting rock bottom. Then he heard a familiar melody. See, Grandpa had respected Godo's wishes not to talk about God. But Grandpa was a whistler. So when he was in the chicken houses, he whistled. And what songs did he know? Hymns. Right. So that drunken evening... One of those hymns was drifting out on the wind from one of the churches. Godo followed it, followed that sound coming on the wind into the church, and he told the pastor that he wanted to be baptized. The pastor told him, you're drunk, come back when you're sober. And he thought he'd never see him again. But Godo showed up. He got sober. He was reconciled with his family. He worked in the Mennonite hospital there for many years. And he became and remains a faithful member of the Mennonite church at Batania. When my mom, who's here this morning, that's why I keep looking over here, 
visited the church at Batania for her first time since childhood, Godo came up to her. Are you Berkey? When she said yes, he gave her a big bear hug. When we visited the church in May, my uncle, who's good friends with Godo, had told him we would be coming. And Godo smiled at me. You Berkey? And I got my own bear hug. He also insisted on buying all of us a chicken dinner, which we ate right beside my mom's first grade classroom. Our boys say that it is the best chicken they've ever had. There was no long-range planning involved in this story of hope. I don't think my grandpa could have played it out like this. There was no strategic plan. There was just God, the source of hope, blowing around a chicken house and a little town. The days to come were not realized for a couple of decades, and the story wasn't fully known until a generation later. But there we were, two generations later, filled to the brim with hope in a God of bold imagination. The days to come weren't tomorrow, but they also weren't so far off. A lost boy was restored to his family and to his creator, and my grandpa got to see hope fulfilled. My children got to experience the power of hope and of acting faithfully, even though they never even knew their great-grandfather. Restoration hope in chickens and whistling and bear hugs. Our theme this Advent season is restoration is near. Restoration is a process. I promise the tree is coming. And restoration is perpetual. We partner with God in a constant restoration project. The world always feels a little messy doesn't mean the restoration's not happening. It means it continues to happen. It is continuous. We are continuously grinding swords into plowshares, continuously learning peace, perpetually turning our ears away from the siren call of individualism and toward the wisdom of God. Constantly redirecting our steps from the ways of idolatry to the mountain of God. Always reorienting from trusting in systems and rulers and nations to trusting in God. So take a breath. Look around and breathe in this people of God in all of our messiness. Where is hope in the wind? What next faithful steps can we take to follow that hope? We may not be able to see where hope is leading, and we may not see that until tomorrow or 10 years from now or even 30 years from now. But that's okay. All that is required of us now is that we recognize hope and we follow it. Way back, somewhere around the 7th century BC, a prophet caught the hope in the wind and dared to imagine a world made right. Centuries later, God made the bold move of hope incarnate coming into the world as a tiny, helpless baby. Thousands of years later, we follow that same glimmer of hope to a manger, to a story that we've come to claim as our own. We follow it to a way that is, at times, audacious, boldly imaginative, often rather messy, full of ridiculous hope. We step into Advent and join in God's work of restoration.
Thank you, Talasha, for reminding us that hope is something that we step into and wait. In response, let's sing number 225, We Come. Number 225, We Come. And I invite you to stand in body or in spirit as you are able. It is now time for us to worship God with our tithes and our offerings, and today with our special gifts for our Advent offering. Each week of Advent this year, you can bring offerings of winter clothing that will be given to people who are new to our church community, who are experiencing this climate and experiencing winter for the first time. Look in your weekly CMC emails for more information about specific things to bring each week so that we can have enough to share with all. I invite you to bring your regular offerings up to the baskets that will be here and your Advent offering up to the basket at the tree stand as we sing together our offertory. So turn in voices together to number 391, O Soso. We will sing this together. And we will sing verse one in English, then verse one again in Spanish, and then continue on with the rest of the song. So bring your offerings, sing your offering, and give God your best with a glad and joyful heart.
she want to blow out the candle? We will continue doing this offering of things for cold weather every week of Advent. So keep that in mind as you do other shopping in these weeks to come. Join me in prayer. God, you are indeed our source of hope. Sometimes we're not sure where that hope is going to come from, but you show up. I pray that you will give us the courage to look around and the courage to follow you into the next steps. Bless these gifts that we have brought forward today and use them to spread your hope in our community and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Join now in singing number 214, Savior of the Nations, Come. Verses 1, 2, and 3. Just a reminder, as you leave today, if you do not have an Advent wreath or candles, feel free to pick those up in the hallway this morning uh, and next week. So you can find those resources out there for celebrating Advent at home this year. So as we go into this new season of Advent, go full of hope because the God who began a good work in us will bring it to completion. Go in peace.